Good to go. Good morning and welcome to the gathering Zoom edition. Whether, whether you're live with us or joining us via YouTube, we're glad you're here. A little bit about our service. It's similar to our face-to-face -face gathering service. We start and end with fellowship time. We enjoy great music. I must say the praise band is exceptional. And we learn a lot from our, uh, we learn a lot from our outstanding pastoral team. Snacks and drinks are always welcome, but you have to provide your own now. And if you have an offering, feel free to visit our website, www.silverspring.org at any time, and feel free to give. And now I'd like to share some announcements. Just have a couple announcements this week. Our blessing of the backpacks is next Sunday, August 23rd. All students are encouraged to watch for a special envelope that should arrive in your mail soon. Please don't open it until next week. During each of our online services, uh, you'll be invited to open your envelope as a part of the special recognition of our students. We hope you'll join us and we'll know that your church family is praying for you. Also on August 23rd, the Core Youth Ministries Back to School Bash and Calendar Meeting is happening. The meeting will begin at the church at 6 p.m. by the preschool entrance and start with a brief overview of the schedule of events through August of 2021. Then the youth will enjoy their back to school bash activities while the parents are briefed further on the year. We have a few um, prayers to, to remember today. Prayers of healing for Forrest Adams, Dave Corbin and John Clegg. Prayers of, symph of sympathy for Deb Path. And prayers for our military members, Justin Ledvina, Josiah Scandal, Wyatt LaPointe and Brandon Johnson. And now if you'll join me on our call to worship. Let all the people praise you, O God, for you guide the nations upon the earth. We are gathered here to worship, O God. Let us praise your name. Now join me in singing, Here I Am to Worship.
And now as we come into a time of confession, let us bow our heads. Gracious God, we come to you this morning as broken people. We need your eternal wisdom and grace. We have fallen short of what you have called us to be. You've made it simple for us. Love you and love others. Yet we find ourselves spreading hate and misunderstanding rather than love and compassion. Forgive us, Lord, and mold us into the masterpiece that you see every time you look at us. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, the old life is gone. The new life has begun. Through the amazing grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. And now, as those who know the love of God, let us share the peace of Christ with one another. I invite you to share it through the chat or the emoticons. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Let's try and get the sound on this one. This in the background of Brian's picture there. That's uh, what's her name? Bethany. Beth no. That's um. That's Emma. Emma. Is that? Yeah. Hello there. Yeah. Jane was joining mm -hmm. today. They have problems with this. Okay. Um, so, Don, I think you're up for the time with children while Jane is getting the scripture ready. Uh, you're muted. How's that? Is that better? <laughs> all right. Let me ask you to take a moment, all of us, and look for the chat field. And would you type in there what your favorite thing to have for breakfast is? What you have this morning, for example? Just take a second and chat that. I'm, I'm going to be looking at uh, looking at your responses here as I as I talk. Somebody had cereal. Nathan says cinnamon toast crunch. Somebody else said nothing. Oh dear, that's not good. Biscuits and gravy, Jane. That's impressive. Very southern. And a chocolate chip muffin. You go. Somebody had oatmeal, eggs, and a bagel. All right, very nice. So what I normally have for breakfast is um, this. Nate, now, Kate and, and Nathan, where are you here? Let me make sure I can see you. I am going to minimize my chat box here. So Nathan, what, uh, what is this? You might have to unmute him. Or you can chat it. You want to put it in the chat field? It's in orange. It's in orange. So let me ask you, I have this pretty much every morning along with some other fruit and yogurt. Do you think that this is, Kate, is this a good orange? Thumbs up, thumbs down. What do you think? I'll try to put it close to the camera so you can see. Does this look like a good orange to you? Thumbs down. <laughs> well, to me, what do you think, Nathan? Thumbs up, okay. I, what about the rest of you? Thumbs up or thumbs down? You can use your, uh, I got a lot of thumbs up going on over here. Oh, and a thumbs down from Emily, all right. And Alex and John, you're not so sure. Well, I'll tell you, if you were here, you'd see that from the outside, it looks pretty darn perfect. I couldn't find too many blemishes at all. In fact, it's nicely orange. All It's round. It hasn't been squished. It's not soft. It looks like a good orange. And from what I know of oranges in the past, this is probably going to be a good one. But there's only one way to really tell. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to take a second. I don't know if you can all see this, but I'm going to go ahead and cut this orange in half. Um, what do you know? All right, now what do you think? 
Good orange? Looking good, right? Well, I'm thinking that it's a good orange because what you see on the outside looks good, but what really makes it a good orange is what's on the inside that counts. So not only does it look good, but it tastes good, it's gonna taste good as well, and it looks good from the inside too. So I, I have to say that I think this is part of the message that John of Patmos is receiving as Jesus speaks through him and gives him a vision of the church at Sardis. The church has a reputation for its past acts of being a really active, faithful congregation, but it has lapsed. They have forgotten who they are and whose they are, and they're no longer doing the kinds of things that would be pleasing in Christ's sight as he judges the, the churches. Well, that's what, what, what God expects of the church and of each of us is that we remember that we have to love God and our neighbor, not just eons ago, not even last year, but today, now. That's what makes a good church and a, frankly, a good Christian too. And the way that way we can be sure that what our reputation is, what we look like from the outside matches what we are on the inside. And that's the message. So I'm going to enjoy my orange. So over to you. All right. Thanks, Don. Let me get my screen up here. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Hear now the word of the Lord. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is at the point of death, for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard, obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet you have still a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. And now, O oh God, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, may they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You know, I have always been a night owl. I am not a morning person at all. And my problem has always been not just waking up, but also staying awake. And so when I was growing up, my poor mother <laughs> used to come into my room and wake me up and she would think that I was awake and up for the day because I would act like I was up. I would, you know, get up, go to the bathroom, maybe even start to pick my clothes out. But then once she left, I would crawl back into bed. And so like 30 minutes later, she would come in and yell at me again. And then like 10 minutes after that, she would come and yell at me again. Well, now my husband gets the pleasure of experiencing all of that. And to this day, most days I set like six different alarms over the course of 45 minutes or an hour. If I do say so myself, I am a master of making it appear as though I really am going to get up in the morning. And then I go back to sleep. 
well. Our text today is a call to the church at Sardis to wake up. Now, Sardis was the capital of the Lydian Empire. It was a major urban complex and it had a gym and a bath building. There was a really big synagogue in the heart of the city, which was pretty unusual because um, synagogues were often at the outskirts of the city. Um, but this Sardis was a wealthy inland city. It was very prosperous in the time of John of Patmos. And it became famous as the city of lost wealth. In fact, nighttime attacks devastated Sardis, not once, but twice. And John is saying here that Christ's vision of Sardis is that it appears to be alive, but it is actually dead. But John hasn't lost hope for this church. There is still a chance of resurrection. There's this longing to revive and to awaken them. Now, maybe you have heard there's this phenomenon in medicine occasionally um, where people are pronounced dead when they're actually alive. And maybe you've heard of people sort of coming back to life after hours or even maybe even days. Well, this is called catalepsy. It's a medical condition that seemingly happens more to people with um, epilepsy. And it's a trance-like state where the muscles become rigid and the person is unresponsive, completely unresponsive to stimuli. It's also something that's used in hypnosis, by the way. But I imagine that what John is describing in our text today, a church that seems to be alive but is actually dead, is much worse than seeming to be dead, but actually being alive. You see, Sardis is alive in name only. It had a great reputation, but no substance. It was going through the motions, but it wasn't genuine. It was only alive in name, but it was really dead. This church was seen as flourishing, as active, as successful by everyone except for Christ. The, the church at Sardis had a famous past, but it had a declining future. It was secure and untroubled, but it was unable to distinguish itself from the culture that surrounded it. It had a lack of self-awareness. And the big problem with the church at Sardis was that it had become complacent. It was experiencing witness facade. There was no transformative effect of the gospel of Jesus Christ on this church. It was maintaining appearances rather than holding true to reality. Well, in this context, Jesus becomes a most dangerous intruder who comes to rob them of the complacency that they mistake for security. You know, there are a lot of churches today that like to maintain appearances, whether it's through staffing, or programs, or buildings, or relationships, or other things. For example, in staffing or in lack of staffing, we see in churches that there is an indicator of financial position in the size of a church's budget. We assume that if a church has staff, then it also has the money to do the things that it wants to do to to carry out the ministry that it feels called to. Having a robust staff suggests happiness and contentment. And in a church that is healthy, there are clearly defined boundaries for staff to maintain a healthy work-life balance. In a healthy 
church, there's an understanding that the congregation participates in ministry and that the staff is there to equip the saints for ministry. However, in an unhealthy church, we see that sometimes there are problems, conflicts within the staff, or maybe there is an over-dependence on staff. There might be an attitude that the church hires out its ministry. Or sometimes in an unhealthy church, the church can't actually financially sustain its staff. Another way that churches tend to maintain appearances sometimes are in their programs. Programs suggest that the church is meeting the needs of its members and of the community. Programs presume that a church has people who participate in them and that the programs meet a felt need. And in a healthy church, programming is based is designed based on the input from those that the program seeks to serve. It changes with the changing needs of the people and the changing culture. And when a program reaches the end of its life, we give thanks for the ministry that was done through it and we let it die, having faith that something else will be resurrected in its place. But in an unhealthy church, we see that sometimes decisions for programming are based on the desires of only a few people. Or maybe we see that programming happens because the church has done the same thing every year because that's what it's always done. And so people tire of these programs and they quit coming. Another way that some churches tend to maintain appearances is with buildings. Now, don't get me wrong, buildings are certainly an asset for ministry. They suggest stability and, again, financial solvency. And well-maintained buildings are a great asset for the wider community, whereas poorly maintained buildings can be a huge drain on a congregation. Now, in a healthy church, a building is seen as a resource for ministry, and it's maintained as necessary to accomplish the goals of ministry. In a healthy church, the building is used frequently throughout the week, not only by the church itself, but by the community and for the community at large. And the upkeep and maintenance of the building is a communal effort. However, in an unhealthy congregation, the building is mistaken for being the church. Money is often disproportionately poured into a building at the cost of maintaining or starting healthy ministries. And in an unhealthy congregation, the building is often seen as one of the main ministries or the most important aspect of ministry. Finally, another way that we sometimes maintain appearances in the church is through relationships. Relationships are shared among people within the worshiping community and they are the lifeblood of the church. They're essential in order for the church to be the church. After all, the church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is people, is what the children's song says. And so in a healthy congregation, we see that there's a healthy mutuality among church members as well as between church members and staff. We see that there is pairing on a congregational level that reaches across barriers that could otherwise separate us, barriers like age or class or race or sexual orientation. And in a healthy congregation, we see that there's a willingness to demonstrate vulnerability in our relationships, including 
talking about and processing weaknesses and past hurts and sorrows. However, in an unhealthy congregation, we see that oftentimes there is triangulation, which means that if there is a problem between person A and person B, instead of going person A to person B, they go to person C and tell them about it rather than dealing with the problem directly. And that often leads to parking lot meetings and gossip and all sorts of things. Also in an unhealthy system, in an unhealthy congregation, the church is not a place where we have friends. There's an inability to be authentic, to talk about it, to talk about life and to share in real life. There's a lack of knowledge or willingness to encourage others in their own discipleship. And there's also a lack of sharing meals together, which is another marker of a healthy congregation. Well, maybe you see both some areas of health and unhealth in our congregation here at Silver Spring Presbyterian Church. Maybe you see some areas of health and unhealth in the ways that you fit into this congregation. And that's normal. Every church has areas of health and unhealth. But the key is to maximize the healthy aspects and minimize the unhealthy aspects of these areas where churches often tend to maintain appearances that aren't genuine. The church at Sardis, you see, had fallen into way too many areas of unhealth. And while they weren't a lost cause, Christ's call to them to wake up might also be a wake-up call for us, too. Why is this so important? Well, it might be helpful to take a hint from the model, Cameron Russell, who you see here on your screen. A few years ago, back in 2013, she gave a TED Talk. And at the beginning of the TED Talk, she enters the stage wearing a very tight-fitting, short black dress and high heels. And she starts off the TED Talk by saying, there is an uncomfortable tension right now because I should not have worn this dress. And so she says, luckily, I brought an outfit change. And this is the first outfit change on the TED stage. So you guys are pretty lucky to witness it. And she proceeds to cover herself up with another change of clothes. And then she goes on to note her privilege to transform what you think of me, she says, in a very brief 10 seconds. Not everybody gets to do that. And she says, why did I do that? Image is powerful, but also image is superficial. She says, I just totally transformed what you thought of me in six seconds. Well, let's see what else she has to say. Just a moment here. I will demonstrate for you now 10 years of accumulated model knowledge because unlike cardiothoracic surgeons, it can just be distilled right into right now. So if the photographer is right there and the light is right there like a nice HMI and the client says, Cameron, we want a walking shot. Well, then this leg goes first, nice and long. This arm goes back, this arm goes forward, the head is at three quarters and you just go back and forth. You just do that. And then you look back at your imaginary friends 300, 400, 500 times. <laughs> It will look something like this. Um, hopefully less awkward than that one in the middle. That was, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> Unfortunately, after you've gone to school and you have a resume and you've done a few jobs, you can't say anything anymore. So 
if you say you want to be the president of the United States, but your resume reads underwear model 10 years, people give you a funny look. <laughs> the next question people always ask me is do they retouch all the photos? And yeah, they pretty much retouch all the photos, but that is only a small component of what's happening. This picture is the very first picture that I ever took, and it's also the very first time that I had worn a bikini. And I didn't even have my period yet. I know we're getting personal, but uh, you know, I was a young girl. This is what I looked like with my grandma just um, a few months earlier. Here's me on the same day as this shoot, my friend got to come with me. Here's me at a slumber party a few days before I shot French Vogue. Um, here's me on the soccer team and in V Magazine. And here's me today. And I hope what you're seeing is that these pictures are not pictures of me. They are constructions. And they are constructions by professionals, by hairstylists, and makeup artists, and photographers, and stylists, and all of their assistants, and pre-production, and post-production. And they build this. That's not me. Um, So, the church at Sardis had gotten so far away from who they were that they didn't recognize themselves anymore. They weren't recognizable to others anymore. At Silver Spring, we have worked on a vision statement saying who we want to become, a grace-filled family of faith sharing Christ's love with all. But who are we? Why do we exist? Who does Christ call us to be? And what does Christ call us to do? These are the questions that we need to answer if we are to grow into the health that God desires for us. Because waking up is one thing, but staying awake is another. And God calls us to stay awake. So let's keep at it. Amen. Jane, may we as a church strive to stay spiritually healthy. Um, personally, one way for me to strive for spiritual health is through music. Our next song is Better Is One Day. As most of you know, I like to share a little bit about our music. Some of you may know that this song was written and performed originally by Matt Redman. And he has written and co-written some of our favorite songs of the gathering, including 10,000 Reasons, and our closer this week, Blessed Be Your Name. But what you might not know is that the words are much older. The inspiration of this song came from, mostly from Psalm 84. In fact, some of the lines are word for word from the scripture. Matt was looking for a modern day Psalm when he wrote this song, pulling from Psalm 84 and various others. As we struggle with all the events of this year, let us remember the theme of this song. Better is one day in his courts, better is one day in his house than thousands elsewhere. His spirit truly is water to our souls. Please join me in singing Better is One Day.
friends, join me now in a time of prayer. Let us pray. God of grace and goodness and mercy and providence, we thank you for the very gift of our lives. We thank you for the grace we know through your son, Jesus Christ. And we are grateful that in him, we not only have come to know you, but we have come to know our new life. Indeed, it is his presence that drives us into your courts to praise you as we do this morning. Indeed, we trust in him. We place all our trust in him. And we, we seek faithfulness as all in your church do. We would be a faithful church, we pray, in the way that we love you and that we love our neighbors as Jesus showed and taught us to do. May we never lose the zeal for serving him that way. We pray too for our community, for our nation and our world. We are all reeling from the effects of the pandemic still, and we are weary, Lord. But even as we begin to complain a bit about that cabin fever we feel, we remember that there are those for whom this is a matter of life and death. We praise you for all who would heal others and work to work to make those who have some, succumbed to the virus well and to help them recover. We pray too for the families of those who have not recovered. Indeed, we, we pray for all who are suffering any kind of illness and we take a moment now simply to either enter their names in the chat field or to speak them aloud in our own homes. Carol. Emma. Lord, we also hold up to you those who are unemployed and underemployed. We ask that you would guide them to the work that you have already selected for them. Calm their hearts and their anxiety and guide us to be those means of support for them that you call us to be. Remind us too, Lord, that we are the stewards of this beautiful creation in which you have placed us to thrive. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for the gift of nature. Thank you for the, the way in these days, especially that nature is not just sustenance, but a restoration to weary souls and minds and spirits that are succumbed have succumbed to anxiety calm us lord let it be a reminder as we look outside on your green earth that you provide that not a hair on our heads would be go unnumbered or uncared for because you love us that much Lord, bless all who protect others, keep them safe and mindful that they serve all of our communities, all in our communities. And now we gather up all of our prayers and we pray as Jesus taught, saying together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us now close our time of worship with Blessed Be Your Name.
friends, go out now into the world, remembering that God calls us to wake up and to stay awake. God calls us to authenticity, to shared relationship, to responsible ministry, and to glorifying God's name and making Christ known in all the world. So go now and do that. And as you do, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.